Here, I am the former Minister of Immigration for New Zealand. And welcome to a presentation, a TDA presentation, on the skilled migrant category for resident visa. Now, if you are applying for residency or want to apply for residency as a skilled migrant, there are many criteria, but really, if you've graduated here in New Zealand, the only thing that matters is that you have employment in a skilled occupation. And why is that all that matters? Let's have a look at the selection criteria. Now, the criteria for the last several years, the Minister looks at it every couple of weeks and nothing has changed for several years. And one of those criteria for residency is that all those with a job or job offer that had a points total of 100 or more points but less than 140 points. Okay, so if you've got a job offer and if you've got at least 100 points, you will be invited to apply for a residency. If you have 140 points, you get invited anyway, that's automatic. But it doesn't mean you'll get a residency just because you have 140 points. You'll only get a residency if you have skilled employment. If you have 150 points but no skilled job offer, you will not get residency. The best you'll do is get um, offered a work visa to allow you time to find that job, that skilled job. So let's look at the criteria. Recognize qualification. The minimum you can get is 40 points for a certificate. That's a trade certificate. If you study for a diploma, you'll get 50 points and a bachelor 70 points, PhD, master's, you get even more. But the minimum you get is the 40. Now your age, you'll get at least 10 points if you're eligible for age points under the age of 50. Most of you who are applying who just recently graduated, you'll be under 30 probably, some in the 30s, but those ones you may get 30 points, up to 30 points. But the minimum is 10, so already you've got 50 points. A job offer, you get 50 points. So that's what I mean, that adds up to 100. So no matter what you get, the minimum for qualification, the minimum for age, gives you 50, plus the employment offer, 50, you've got your 100 points. And if immigration assess all your documents as being okay, good health, good character, you should be granted a residence visa. Now, recognizing skilled employment, how do we go about that? Appendix 6 of the immigration instructions, that's where it all starts. That is the list of immigration instructions, Appendix 6, that lists all of the occupations that Immigration New Zealand consider to be skilled. Okay, those occupations are listed by what we call the ANSCO classification. The Australia New Zealand Standard Classification of Occupations. We call it ANSCO. That's the Bible for Immigration New Zealand and that describes all occupations of every job in New Zealand. So choosing the ANSCO classification for your occupation is critical. You have to choose an ANSCO classification that is in Appendix 6 and that you can prove um, is the appropriate match for your job. The fact that you may call yourself an accountant, which is skilled, doesn't mean anything unless you can prove you are an accountant. Okay, now. Just quickly on issues for recognizing qualifications, if you've graduated here in New Zealand, that'll be pretty straightforward. You don't have any problems there. It's already recognized. However, you may have a qualification from overseas, from India, from China, from the US, wherever. You go to Appendix 3 if you want that qualification to be recognized. That Appendix 3 immigration instructions lists all of the pre-assessed, pre-approved um, qualifications from around the world. If it's not in that list, you need to apply to the New Zealand Qualifications Authority, NZQA, and they will assess your qualification. Now, once you've assessed that qualification, you've got your recognized qualification, you need to check with ANSCO and your job, because the jobs, the occupations in ANSCO also describe the appropriate qualification. In many cases, it um, it may be a diploma or a bachelor or a certificate okay now most of you have done like business type qualifications if you've only got a diploma 
there's only five occupations in normal business activities that you can you can um, get a residency for because most occupations like managerial administration manager marketing manager sales manager a production manager they are all commensurate with a bachelor degree and immigration is going to require you to have a bachelor degree so even if you are doing that job administration manager being paid a hundred thousand dollars a year you will not get residency because you don't have a bachelor you need to be an office manager or a client service manager which only requires a diploma so you need to be very careful when you're selecting jobs selecting what occupation you have now write a job description if you get this wrong you screw it up believe me you're dead your application will be declined immigration new zealand have an expectation that your job description will largely have a substantial match to ansco ansco has a lead statement and list of tasks and duties here's an example of a lead statement for chef your job Chefs plan and organize the preparation and cooking of food and dining and catering establishments. You have to convince Immigration New Zealand, if you're applying as a chef, that that's what you do. And the way of doing that is here are all the tasks listed for a chef. Planning menus, estimating food and labor costs and ordering food supplies. Monitoring quality of dishes at all stages of preparation and presentation. Discussing food preparation issues with managers, dietitians and kitchen waiting staff demonstrating techniques and advising on cooking procedures, preparing and cooking of food, explaining and enforcing hygiene regulations, may select and train staff, may freeze and preserve foods. If you do all those and you can prove it to immigration um, with documents, um, in any other way you wish to provide evidence, you should be fine. Now, most chefs that I know, they are employed to prepare and cook food. However, Immigration New Zealand, I can tell you now, put a lot of emphasis on planning menus, estimating food and labor costs. You need to demonstrate those things. Now, another point that is often raised as a point of prejudicial information is market rate salary. You may be on a salary of $40,000. Immigration may write to you and say, we note you on $40,000. We consider your rate is too low because the average for your occupation according to trade me seek internet sites Hayes recruitment agency is forty nine thousand dollars okay however they're wrong immigration is wrong when they say things like that because it has been confirmed by the immigration and protection tribunal that the income range the market rate is from the lowest paid New Zealander to the highest paid for an occupation so as long as you can prove that your salary is higher than the lowest paid New Zealander, you are within the market rate. Now, there is only one document in this country that um, we rely on because it's the only document that contains the income for 100% of every worker in New Zealand and it's organized by the ANSCO. It's a government document, it's the census. And that's what the government relies on for its own career services website. And as long as you can demonstrate that your occupation, your salary is with above the minimum, you will be okay. And we're very good at doing that. We've never lost yet um, when we believe your salary is correct and within those rates. Now, expression of interest, EOI, that's stage one of your application. First thing on there, get your job description right. If you're our client, it's the one thing that I always check myself for every client. I always check that job description because if you don't get that right, as I said, you're dead. Now, disclose everything on the EOI. In case something goes wrong, your appeal depends on it. We don't plan on things going wrong. But if you don't disclose the fact that you were declined a visa to enter the United States, Canada, Australia, or any other country, or you don't disclose the fact that you had a drink drive conviction or speeding conviction, and immigration later find out about it, you will be declined as a bad character. Okay? The problem is not that you were drink driving. The problem isn't that you were denied entry in the United States. The problem is you didn't disclose it. You lied. You provided false information. 
And even though you may be a wonderful applicant with 180 points and a brilliant job, you will not be able to appeal to the tribunal or to the High Court because the law prevents you from doing so because you provided false information at this stage. There is specific legislation that prohibits the courts, prohibits the tribunal from considering your application if you were declined because you didn't disclose something, okay? So always disclose. Now, once you've put in your expression of interest, the next stage is you should receive an invitation to apply for residency. At that stage, you'll be given four months to provide all your documents. Because when you do the EOY, it's an online thing, you don't have to provide any evidence at that stage. But you will be asked to provide it later. You have four months to put it in, and um, then an officer will be assigned to your allocation, I mean to your application, and that officer will then go through um, and consider whether you should be approved or not. Now, very high chance, many people then receive a letter um, from an officer with a point of prejudicial information. The letter goes, sort of, dear applicant, thank you for your application, I have the following concerns. Those are points of prejudicial information. At TDA, we try and predict what they may come back with. And we don't want to wait for INZ to raise a PPI, point of prejudicial information. So first, if you're my client, TDA client, our officers will go through and identify possible areas where an immigration officer might consider raising a PPI. Market salary is a good one. Or your job, you don't do the right task. We will go through that and we will address that in the cover letter for your um, submitting your ITA. Okay, so we address those points of information. For example, if your salary is 38,000, you will almost certainly get a letter from immigration saying your salary is too low, it's not within the market rate. If we believe it's within the market rate, we'll check with the census and we will do submissions on that as to why you are. We don't want to wait for the immigration officer because if you do, you are then in a position, you have to convince the officer to admit that he or she is wrong. Human nature says they don't want to do that, okay? Much better that you put your point in first because then you reverse the roles. The officer then would have to explain to you why your points are wrong. Slightly different, but very important. Now, the verification interview. Many of you will be called up on the telephone. You may even get a visit from a verification officer. They'll want to talk to you or your employer, either by phone or face to face. This is a hugely, hugely critical moment for you. And that's the advice. Don't say anything. Be very careful. Get it wrong, you're gone. Now, they, as I said, they may call you on the phone, call your employer on the phone, or turn up at your work. Now, what does your employer say to the immigration officer? We want your employer to be as helpful as possible. But being helpful is not talking to the officer on the phone. That could get you into trouble. We want your employer to say, I am happy to try and answer all your questions. Please send them to me in writing. That means your employer can sit down and consider those questions because when they send questions, there's usually 30, 40 questions. And you don't want your employer trying to answer those on the telephone when he's unprepared, hasn't thought about them, and half the time doesn't even know the answers. You probably know the answers, okay? That way he can, he can do that. When it's in writing, we, we know exactly what the question is and what the answer is. And we can give advice on that. Now you, and oh, but besides, your employer doesn't actually have to talk to the officer. He's not an applicant. But we hope he will be helpful and do those questions. But you, the officer wants to interview you, you have to be interviewed. But you don't have to be interviewed right then and there. They can't just turn up and demand that they interview you you then, they will try many times, but we want you to say, please call my advisor and arrange for an interview. Because that's your right. The law says, the immigration policy says, you are entitled to have your representative at any interview. That means you're entitled to say, I want Mr. Delamere to be here for the interview. So they will call me and we'll arrange a time in a few days. Because I very much doubt that I'm available to drop everything and run down to wherever you happen to be. 
fact, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to arrange a time in a few days. And then we can meet and discuss just what might be, be happening. How do you prepare for an interview? Well, you don't answer questions when they phone you up on the phone. You won't be prepared. Could have been six months since you put your application in. You'll freak out. Oh my God, what should I say? So you just say, poor Mr. Delamere. Now, here's an example of a question. This has been asked many times. I've heard it, seen it, listened to it. It's for shop manager, retail manager. This is the second task of ANSCO. And I've heard it on the phone. And the question goes like this. Hello applicant, how do you go about formulating and implementing the purchasing policies, the marketing policies and the setting of prices? Most people, me included, got stuck at formulating. Didn't hear a thing after that. Formulating, formulating, what the heck? Oh, you didn't even hear the rest of it. You're in trouble, okay? That's why you say, call me, don't answer that question. Now, the reason it's, it's difficult, it's very unfair, okay? It's a very difficult question because it's six questions. How do you formulate the purchasing policy? How do you formulate the marketing policies? How do you formulate the setting of prices? How do you implement the purchasing policies? How do you implement the marketing policies? How do you implement the setting of prices? You may do all of those tasks, but if you ask that question in this format, you'll almost certainly become dumb. You won't know what to say. You won't have gone and heard anything past formulating, okay? So call me, don't answer it. If everything goes bad, you still declined, you can appeal to the Immigration um, and Protection Tribunal. It's not a great position to be in because it takes about 18 months these days and so your whole life is on hold. Anyway, I hope this um, short lecture has been helpful. I would love to see you here at TDA and if we can help, great, give us a call. Thanks for listening.